We're going to go through a group tonight that's going to make you scratch your head. Just by way of reminder, a couple housekeeping items. First off, tonight will be the last of our five-week session on cults. Next week, Clint will be back, and we'll start a five-week session through, it'll be our continued study of the Old Testament. I forget what book he'll pick back up with, but he'll be back here next Wednesday night, and I'll be over at our Mallet Creek campus. I'll do a five-week series on major Christian denominations. So if that's of interest to you, I'll be back here another five weeks from now, and Lord willing, I'll actually get to stick around with you guys for most of those five weeks, and we'll walk through those major Christian denominations uh, when I'm back here. That's the first item to note. Uh, The second one is just remember, when you hear the word cult, I've, I've said this before, but when you hear the word cult, don't think wrongly of what is actually called the occult. Oftentimes when you hear that odd word cult, you're thinking about that crazy sort of weird, demonic, you know, like Ouija boards, wizards and whatnot, Harry Potter type stuff. And that's, that's really better classified as the occult from the Latin word occulter, which means hidden or concealed. When we use the word cult, cult is actually from the Latin word cultus, which means worship. And the truth of the matter is a cult looks a lot like Christianity. Witchcraft and wizardry clearly does not. Cults do. The definition of a cult is something that presents itself, in in other words, a Christian cult, something that presents itself as Christianity, but upon closer inspection, we realize it's not. Now tonight, our cult that we will be studying is one some of you may have never even heard of. It's what's called Christian science. Now, to be clear, this is not Scientology. A lot of folks are familiar with Scientology. It's pretty famous largely because it's so inbred in Hollywood. Scientology is something altogether different. Christian science is a uniquely Christian cult. And I'm just going to give you guys all the cliff notes from the outset and then spend the rest of our time unpacking this. Guess what, folks? Christian science is a lot like grape nuts. Any of y'all ever had grape nut cereal? You know, the funny thing about grape nut cereal is it's neither grapes nor nuts. And Christian science is neither Christian nor science. It's the oddest term. And tonight you're going to see who came up with it, what on earth they believe, why they're still around, And Lord willing, you will conclude with me at the end of our session that, man, this is not Christianity. This is hardly even cult. This is nothing more than a bunch of grape nuts. So why don't you join me as we pray. Let's ask God to help us. And then we'll commence our study of Christian science. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for these brothers and sisters. And I'm asking that you would grant me a clarity of communication to be right and faithful and true and charitable. I want to rightly convey what this group believes. I do not want to create a caricature. And I want to do this, Lord, so that we will know what they believe, why they believe it, and we'll be well equipped to respond with the truth of the gospel and the hope that is within us. And so I'm asking that you would, by your grace, speak to your people through me in spite of me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I recognize that many of you perhaps have never heard of it before, but if you have, when you hear the word Christian science... What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Maybe for some of you, you are familiar with the few people associated with this cult. Maybe you're familiar with the originator of it, the lady through whom all Christian science is rooted, a lady named Mary Baker Eddy. But I'm guessing most of you are unfamiliar with her. Maybe you're familiar with some of these names and you had no idea they were associated with Christian science. Did you know the two twin men that helped Richard Nixon perpetrate Watergate, uh, John Ehrlichman and H.R. Haldeman, those were his chief of staff and his senior advisor. They were big names in the 1970s. These two men were Christian scientists. They were a part of this cult. Uh, The actor Val Kilmer Part of this cult, you ever heard of the famed book Catcher in the Rye, entitled, uh, written rather, authored by J.D. Salinger? That man was a member of the cult Christian science. If those names aren't resonating with you as much, I guarantee these names will. Did you know these following famed individuals were reared 
in the cult of Christian science. They didn't necessarily practice it as consenting adults, but as children, they were raised. People like Ellen DeGeneres, and that a shock. She was involved in this cult evidently growing up. Marilyn Monroe, Robin Williams, Elizabeth Taylor, Audrey Hepburn. Some of you may remember Shannon Miller. She was the famed gold medalist gymnast from, I believe it was the 1996 uh, Summer Olympics. She was reared in Christian science, which candidly shocked me because Shannon Miller did all of her training in the gym next door to the neighborhood I grew up in, in Oklahoma City. And so when she won the gold medal, we were walking on cloud nine over there thinking that we had this world famous person living right down the street, had no idea that she was reared in this Christian cult. Maybe you think of some people. Or maybe you might be familiar with some places. I was talking to a brother in the elevator and he asked me what I was teaching tonight. He goes, oh, I know Christian science. There's that weird white little colonial church over off Moorhead in Dilworth. And he's exactly right. If you've ever driven down uh, Moorhead, there's this beautiful white colonial church. And if you've ever looked closely on that beautiful little sign that looks like it was taken right off the Mayflower uh, boat, it says, First Church of Christ but then there's a comma, and the word underneath it is scientist. Any of y'all ever seen that church before or a church? First time I saw that, I was like, what? Why? I, that makes no sense to me. It's the pretty much only Christian science church in Charlotte. Or maybe you have seen these weird little places that I saw growing up called Christian science reading rooms. You ever seen that? Here's one in Hendersonville, North Carolina. There was one in Oklahoma City where I grew up. It was right next to a place where my parents banked. And I remember driving by those rooms and I thought, is this like a, a library for science books that are Christian? Like, I had no idea what it was. I was like, okay, I guess people like to go read about science from a Christian perspective in this little room. These are actually unique places designed by the Church of Christ scientists. We're gonna unpack that in a moment. Maybe you're familiar with some places. Or maybe you have heard from news stories of some odd practices from folks involved in this cult. These are the groups of folks that have been largely accused of eschewing any and all medical care. There's actually been some national news stories of people being found liable for criminal child abuse because they kept their children from basic medical care. Because this cult, as a gross generalization, views the practice of modern medicine as unnecessary. We're going to discover tonight that part and parcel of their belief is that prayer heals everything. Now, I want to be careful because I do believe in the power of prayer. I pray for healing. But there is praying for healing and there is presuming upon the riches of God's kindness. So for example, you've heard the old illustration before. There's a man out at sea drowning. And a life raft comes by and he says, oh no, I don't need it. God's going to save me. And then a boat comes by and he says, oh no, I don't need it. God's going to save me. And then a ship comes by and calls out, what can we do to help? He's like, I'm okay. God's going to save me. The boy ends up drowning. He gets to heaven and he says, God, I trusted you. I prayed to you. Why didn't you save me? And he says, I sent you a boat. I sent you a raft. I sent you this, that, and the other. You didn't take any of those means. The truth of the matter is, if you presume upon the riches of God's kindness and say, I don't need common grace because I believe in prayer, that is not a biblical way to view this. And this is part and parcel of the cult of Christian science. It's this odd view, and we're going to unpack in a moment, that prayer heals literally everything. You're going to discover, in fact, that this cult is really all wrapped up in health. It's all about physical health and well-being. So tonight, let's tease out who are these people? Where did it come from? What do they believe? What's their authority? I mean, do they believe and read the Bible? What do, what do these people read? And what exactly do they believe? What is their doctrinal views? And then we'll conclude with that final question. All right, is this a cult or not? What are the major differences here? So let's begin at the beginning and tease out the story of the cult of Christian science. And do you want to know what's remarkable? It began in the same seedbed 
that some of these other cults began in. I didn't teach it to you, but I asked Matt Phipps to teach you on Jehovah's Witnesses, and I did teach you guys on Mormonism. Do you recall where these groups began? They began at a similar time and in a similar place. These two cults, strangely, you might dare say coincidentally, began in upstate New York, the New England region of the United States in the mid-1800s. And you want to know something? Guess where this group began? In upstate New York in the middle 1800s. Do you recall that illustration I used with you two weeks ago? That during the mid-1800s, there was a false great awakening. It was called the Second Great Awakening. There was this religious movement of people that learned how to manufacture a revival. These preachers learned that they could stir up a room. They could get decisions. And so they would come in and whip up everybody into the spiritual fervor and then leave. And guess what happened? There wasn't really true conversion. So it's like everybody got inoculated with Christianity, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't the real deal. And they just got tired of it. And it's like the flames of revival burnt through the region of upstate New York and left nothing but spiritual wasteland. And if you've ever been to a field that's been burned over by a wildfire and there's nothing green left, give it a week or two. And what's the first thing you'll begin to see pop up? It's these little weeds, these vigorous weeds. And spiritually speaking, it's as if the fires of revival burned through that region of the country and in its wake began to pop up these spiritual weeds we would call cults. Jehovah's Witnesses began with C.T. Russell, if you can recall Matt teaching you that. And then I taught you a couple weeks ago that Mormonism was a weed that popped up starting with a man named Joseph Smith tonight. We're going to see there was a yet another weed that popped up in this field in upstate New York, uh, or the New England region. And this weed began with a woman. It was in 1821 or so that there was this young woman reared in New Hampshire. Her name was Mary Baker. And Mary Baker was reared in a home by a relatively, at least, History attests a relatively oppressive dad. She attests that she never really got along with him. She kind of rejected him and his faith in particular. Similar to C.T. Russell, Charles Taz Russell with the Jehovah's Witnesses, she didn't like her daddy's religion. He was a strict congregationalist, which was kind of a general Protestant. And he, she didn't like in particular his views on hell and predestination. She couldn't stomach a God that would send people to hell, and she couldn't stomach a God that was sovereign enough to predestine anything. She rejected it. Consequently, she started to down spiral. In her rejection, she also had this health issue. So she was dealing with two big problems, doubt and disease. And we're not quite sure what the disease was, but let me give you some symptoms of it. She was battling what a lot of folks would just kind of call a, a real psychological problem. She battled all these crazy emotional outbursts that folks around her didn't quite know what to do with. So for example, it's attested that she would writhe and scream in pain. She had what some doctors called spasmodic seizures, whatever that quite means. She dealt with all these strange fevers and they couldn't quite figure out what was going on with her. Some people would argue that all of these symptoms she was exhibiting were basically repercussions of her trauma that she dealt with with her father. But not just her daddy. She actually did go through a lot. So, for example, in about a year's time or so, she lost her brother. She lost her first husband after six months. He died. Then she lost her mother and then she got a fiancé, and then he ended up dying. I mean, that is some serious stuff. I, I sympathize with any individual that would go through those hardest of providences. So some think that this was a psychological repercussion of all the junk she was going through. But there's a lot of other people, and I'll be honest, there's more people in this category who would say, nah, she was what you call a hypochondriac. She was just one of those people that was kind of crazy, and she was showing it by the way she acted. Be that as it may, whatever the uh, explanation is, she did what a lot of other people do. 
When you have a great malady, something that's really, really bothering you, particularly if it's health related, oftentimes you're driven out of a sense of despair and hopelessness to do anything to get better. Today, it might be you go to doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor. In the mid-1800s, there wasn't a lot of that. And so she was desperately looking for somebody, something that could give her some relief from this disease that she had. Well, in that day and time, there was actually, coincidentally, a movement that was spreading throughout that region of America in the mid-1800s. It was called the New Thought Movement. And this movement of thought, this new thought movement, was basically a bunch of people that said, your health is not determined by medicine, but by the mind. There was this view that you could heal yourself with your mind. That your brain, the way you thought about things was powerful enough that you could actually will yourself to escape... <coughs> a lot of the disease-ridden symptoms that you battle. There was one man in particular that became well-known in this era who was teaching this view. His name was Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. What a name. Phineas Parkhurst Quimby became quite an influence in Mary Baker's life. By the way, she ended up marrying, and her name became Mary Baker Eddy. Eddy was her last name. Mary Baker Eddy became involved with this gentleman named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, who is teaching her these ways that you could heal yourself. And allegedly, she practiced some of the things he said, and she experienced some measure of healing. Now, all of her biographers say that healing was short-lived, which, by the way, have you all ever found that even we're uh, symptom, uh, we, we tend to do this? So, for example, you're sick, you take a vitamin C, you get better the next day, and you're like, that's what healed me. But the truth is, it, it might have just been coincidental. Correlation doesn't always equal causation. That, it might have had nothing to do with it. That is probably what happened here. But she thought that this guy helped her get better, and so she concluded, you know what? Here's what I think this man discovered. This is a big logical leap, but follow me. She believed this. He rediscovered the secret of Jesus' healing ministry. Do you want to know why Jesus healed all these people? The reason Jesus could walk around and heal everybody was not because he was like some God figure. It's because Jesus actually learned the secret that we can learn. He learned that you could actually heal somebody with the mind. And so she who was once hopeless found a hope in something and began to teach this hope to other people. Now, before we go any further, I wonder how many of you are sniffing something out with me. How many of you are like, you know what, preacher, this sounds familiar. This is why I hate with a passion and actually don't feel guilty or uncharitable or graceless when I speak out against this. This is why I hate the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Because do you recognize there's some modern Phineas Parkhurst Quimby's on TV right now? There are poor men and women who are racked with physical ailments, homebound. They feel hopeless and they're watching TV. And there are preachers on the television telling them that if they send them money or if they buy this prayer cloth or if they do X, Y, or Z, then they will pray for them and they'll get better. And the truth of the matter is, if you are lonely, isolated, and desperate, you'll do anything. You don't even have to be lonely and isolated. If you're just desperate, you'll do anything. If one of your kids had cancer, you would do anything you could. You'd empty your bank account, you'd stand on one foot, you'd probably try anything if you thought it could give some sense of hope for your child. You'd do that for your spouse. The truth is, desperate people are willing to do stuff, and these liars, these hucksters on TVs, are preying upon them. And Phineas... Parkhurst Quimby, and consequently, Mary Baker Eddy, they were early forebears to these men and women who lie on television and say they can heal. You want to know what's funny? Where were all these faith healers during COVID? They were at home with COVID. <laughs> you ever heard the old adage, physician heal thyself? If you think that you have the ability to provide all this healing, funny 
how you're somehow unable to heal yourself. Mary Baker Eddy began to think that she had rediscovered Jesus' secret to healing. So she first had to validate it. She had to make sure this was true. Well, in 1866, it's reported that she slipped and fell on some ice, hurt herself so terribly that she was sent to whatever sort of hospital situation was available to her and was in what was called what she attested to be critical condition. And while in critical condition in this hospital scenario, she opened up the Bible and she read in Matthew this story of Jesus healing the paralytic. And upon reading and meditating on Jesus healing the paralytic, by the power of her mind, she healed herself. Now, you want to know what's funny? Some of you are thinking, well, Pastor, maybe this is true. I mean, how do you know? Well, guess what? She wasn't the only one in that hospital. She had a doctor. And guess what happened to that doctor? He got asked by a court of law to give an affidavit on what happened. I mean, guess what he attested in that legal affidavit? That lady's cray-cray. <laughs> that's not what happened. She wasn't that sick, and that's, she didn't have that type of recovery. In fact, interestingly enough, Mary Baker Eddy had a lot of critics contemporaneous during her day. Do you want to know who her most famous outspoken critic was? You'll know his name. Any of you all ever heard of Mark Twain? Mark Twain was probably the most vocal opponent of Mary Baker Eddy and her view that she had rediscovered Jesus' secret of healing. She thought she had validated it, and so she began to propagate it. She began to teach it, and she taught it with this name. She labeled her new rediscovered view Christian Science. Now, let's talk through what happened next. She decides she's going to start promoting this newfound view of rediscovering Jesus' healing secret. She entitles it Christian Science, and she goes off and she begins teaching it. The first thing she does is she ends up uh, writing a book, and this book became kind of the holy book of the Christian Science cult. She writes this book. I have it. It's on my bookshelf in my office here at the church. It's entitled... Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And this is basically the Bible, so to speak, of the Christian science cult. My copy looks exactly like that one. I have that version. And in this book, she spells out her theology. Really, it's more of her philosophy of how you can heal yourself according to the secrets Jesus had discovered many years ago. She writes this book. But that book is not really what got the cult going. She went to Boston and she founds a college. It was called the Massachusetts Metaphysical College. And it was in Boston. And she begins to train students in her philosophy. And that's where all the so-called preachers of Christian science began to spread out all over the region. Then she finally ends up starting her own church she starts the first Church of Christ, comma, scientist. And take a look at it. It's standing to this day in Boston. Is that not a beauty? I'm like, well, man, if only that was a Christian gospel preaching church. I'd love to preach in a church like that. It's not a church. It's just a beautiful building. It's like a whitewashed tomb. It looks pretty on the outside. It's dead on the inside. That is the mother church of the Church of Christ scientists, the first church that she founded. Now, interestingly, you're thinking, what do they do at a Church of Christ scientist? What do they practice? Well, interestingly enough, their worship services are fairly sedate. They may sing a hymn or two. They have a short reading. And then they read from the book, Health and Science with Key to the Scriptures. You're wondering, who are the pastors? They don't actually have pastors. Do you know why? Because they believe that that book, Health and Science with Key to the Scriptures, they believe that book is their pastor. So as long as that book is read by any Yahoo, they're getting pastored by that book. Then they'll have silent prayer, and then they'll go 
and read. They said every Church of Christ scientist is required, evidently, to f- create a room called a reading room. And this reading room is basically a study room, kind of like a library of sorts, where they can educate others on their theology or philosophy, which is why you'll tend to see a Christian science reading room in most major American cities. Now, here in Charlotte, the Church of Christ Scientists is that white church on Moorhead. I I don't know where else it's near. It's near a really beautiful Methodist church. But the reading room is actually behind the uh, restaurant. I think it's called like Restaurant 300 300 East or something like that. It's right next door to a... um, uh, what's that coffee shop called? Uh, Sunflower Bakery off East Boulevard, kind of near East and South Boulevard, kind of down in that uh, South End area of Charlotte. The reading room is actually kind of behind that restaurant. So you don't really, most of you have probably never noticed it before. It doesn't have a big uh, signage outside. It's just emblazoned on the glass door coming in. And if you were to go in there, it kind of looks like an old school reading room. It's not very impressive. And that's where you would go and study all of your theology and philosophy of Christian science. So let's tease out together now uh, a few implications of this. Christian science began to explode. There was this meteoric rise of this faith, so to speak. It grew so greatly that there were well over a million adherents to it early on in the late 1800s. But then it began to fall. Now, how many of you think you know why? it began to nosedive. Because unfortunately, guess what happened? People kept dying. Funny, huh? It wasn't really working. It's interesting, isn't it? Isn't it funny that all the faith healers on TV, they can heal those things that you can easily fake. You're sitting in a wheelchair, I can stand. But they're not healing the stage four cancers. They're not healing the terrible physical maladies that there's no way you could fake it. Like it's either there or it's not. They tend to just heal that which you can fake. They were discovering that this view really wasn't actually moving the needle on people's health and well-being. In fact, Mary Baker Eddy herself shockingly died. But what's interesting is upon her death in 1910, it is reported that she said to her associate in confidence, don't tell anybody I died. Tell them I was mentally murdered. Now you're like, what the, huh? Mentally what? I'm going to explain to you why she wanted everybody to think she was mentally murdered in just a moment. We're going to understand why she said that according to her crazy theology. But before we get there, let's now address just in particular, where do they base all of their beliefs? What's their authority? Well, I think you already know what one big pillar of their authority is. It's that book called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. They view this book as their pastor. She wrote this book. It's roughly 700 pages or so. And if you were to read it and kind of break down what the book actually teaches, you would discover that of the 700 pages, about 500 of them are just a bunch of doctrinal teaching. About 100 of them are analyzing random passages of the Bible. And then about 100 of those pages are a bunch of testimonies of people purportedly being healed. But what's interesting is they'll actually tell you that that book is not their only authority. They'll actually tell you that their truest soul authority is the Bible. You're thinking, what? How could you possibly claim to be a Bible-believing Christian and believe all that stuff? Well, they had an interesting view. It's a view very similar to the Mormons. They believed that the Bible was corrupted that what we have today is too corrupted. And the only way we can make sense of the Bible is through the uncorrupted book written by Mary Baker Eddy. So her uncorrupted book, similar to the uncorrupted Book of Mormon, is the key to understand this corrupted Bible. So they hold the two books together, but they can say out of one side of their mouth, the Bible is the main authority, But if you believe the main authority is corrupted and the lesser authority is uncorrupted, 
folks, it doesn't take a PhD to recognize which one is going to get more attention. The uncorrupted book written by the lady who started the whole thing. Their church is basically led in every sense of the word by that former book, Health and Science, with key to the scriptures. Therein lies their odd authority. Now, what on earth do they actually teach? This is where it gets quite interesting. One key conviction underlying her weird worldview is that God is an impersonal, pantheistic, immortal, what's the next word I wrote? Not God, not divine being. God is a mind. This is weird, so hang with me. But she basically taught that God is the definition of reality. That reality is not this. It's not physical stuff. It's not looking at you and me. Reality is God. And what is God? He's not a physical being like you and me. He can't be touched. He's not a personal thing you can interact with. God is just a mind. So now you guys can do math with me. If God is the only reality and God is just a mind, then reality is nothing more than what's in the mind. This is not reality. Things we can see, taste, touch, smell, the empirical senses, that's not real. It's an illusion. God, who is just this mental concept, is the only true reality. Something she would say is, God is all, and all is God. Now that phrase, all is God, is what we call pantheism. That means everything. Pan is from the Greek word all. It means everything is a theism. Everything is theistic. Everything is God. Which, by the way, we know some pantheistic religions. There's some tribal religions. You could argue that Hinduism is essentially pantheism. In a sense, Buddhism, in, to, in certain degrees, is pantheistic as well. It's just this view that basically everything's God. You want to know what's kind of scary? Now, listen, I'm not on some, like, anti-Disney tirade. Matt Phipps would be really disappointed in me. He loves him some Disney. But the truth is, there's a lot of Disney movies. I've been watching a few with my little girl, and I'm like, man, this is just straight pantheism. It's like you go watch Pocahontas, and the whole thing is about basically the divine being being in and through everything. The, the truth is, Christian science is, is really nothing more than just this view that God, whatever that means, is a figment of the mind, and it's anything and everything. So if you're sitting here puzzled and confused and thinking, this feels like a philosophy class, buckle up, it gets weirder. If they think that, then what do they do with the God of the Bible? If the God of the Bible presents himself, like how do you believe that and still say you believe the Bible? What do you do with God the Father and Son and Holy Spirit? Well, they would actually self-righteously say, oh no, we don't believe in the Trinity. That's polytheistic. We don't believe in three. Yeah, that's right. I laughed when I read it too. We don't believe in three gods. That's polytheistic. The extent to which we believe in a trinity is we believe this. It basically, those three things are representative of God's nature. The trinity, if you were to define it, it's not Father, Son, and Spirit. The trinity is really basically life, truth, and love. That's God in his essence. God, the Trinity, is just life, truth, and love. Now, what do they believe about us? Well, it gets even crazier. They believe that man is sinless and divine. Now, why do they believe that? Think with me. They don't believe man is a human, truly. They believe man is like God, just this divine being. Now you got to think with me for a second. If they think that matter doesn't exist, if things that you can see, taste, touch, smell are, are not real, that's not reality. If they think that matter is not reality, then it shouldn't surprise us to think that they think that, well, okay, then mankind really isn't real. We're just this divine being that is presenting ourselves in this illusion of a human body. Anything wrong with man is just a figment of their imagination. It's just an error of their mind. Man isn't fallen. Genesis 3 is just one big old myth. It's really like this allegorical story. 
The truth of the matter is, we are just these spiritual beings that appear to be in human bodies. And so the problem is, when your elbow hurts, when your blood pressure is raised, when your cholesterol is high, do you want to know what your problem is? It's not that double cheeseburger. It's a problem of your brain. It's your mind. You need to think differently, and you can control it. It's the craziest thing ever, isn't it? If you're sitting there like, okay, I'm with you. The whole time I was studying this, I was like, okay. I don't, I don't know where these folks are getting this. The, the, the truth of the matter is, can you guys see where there's satanic uh, influence here? What was one of the first things Satan said? Did God really say that? No, he didn't say that. You're not really, you didn't really do anything wrong. Here's what, here, God was actually trying to trick you. You really should have done this. It's as old as the Garden of Eden. There's this belief, this rejection of God's truth and say, no, man isn't that. This is actually what man is. We're sinless. We are these divine creatures. Sin is just an illusion. The only reality is God. Sin is the opposite of God, which means sin is the opposite of reality. Sin isn't real. It's just this big illusion. Any evil in this world is just wrong thinking. We've got to fix the thinking. Any disease in this world is just mistaken belief. If you just fix the way you thought about yourself, then you would be freed from it. A lot of you doctors in this room are thinking, man, I could have saved a lot of money and trouble going through medical school if I had learned this secret. Now you're thinking, all right, this is crazy. I, this doesn't sound like Christianity, but they claim to be. So what do they believe about Jesus? If they claim to be people of the Bible, what on earth do they do with Jesus? Well, here's what's funny. They view Jesus as just this mere human who came and rescued us from this illusion we're living in. He was just a man prone to error like the rest of us who came and rescued us, helped us open our eyes to see. That's why Jesus' ministry, in their view, was so centrally focused on healing. He was showing us how to escape this illusion, this bondage we're in to disease. Pretty wild, isn't it? And then they viewed this additional thing about Jesus that might confuse you. They differentiate between Jesus and Christ. They say Jesus was just that Palestinian Jew from 2,000 years ago. Christ was something altogether different. Christ, for lack of a better word, is the divine idea. Christ is the concept of truth that breaks through the illusion we're all living in. And the reason we call Jesus, Jesus Christ, is because he was a Palestinian Jew who got the divine idea, discovered the secret. And so he melded together and now he's Jesus Christ, a man who discovered the divine secret of healing. Now you're thinking, all right, weird, but why did Jesus die on the cross? What did the cross do according to their view? Well, here's where it gets sad. They basically view the cross as nothing more than a great demonstration of Jesus Christ's goodness. It wasn't something that atoned for our sin, that secured for our forgiveness, because they don't believe in sin. Sin's an illusion. There's no sin to be forgiven. They believe Jesus dying on the cross was just the greatest demonstration of goodness. And folks, if you think the Christian scientists are the only ones that believe this, you're mistaken. Do you realize at this point they are now lockstep with all the theological liberals of the world, in essence, mainline Protestantism, theological liberalism teaches that Jesus was a great guy, a wise teacher, a moral example, the best of the best, who showed us the definition of goodness. The truth of the matter is, do you know most philosophers in history will tell you Jesus really was in a league of his own. He was a really moral guy. Even the God haters are like, I hate God, but that Jesus, he was something. He's just a moral man. Do you know there are churches all around Charlotte who teach this? You ever seen one of the most beautiful churches, and not my judgment, in all of Charlotte? Myers Park Baptist Church. 
a beautiful building located on a beautiful tree-lined road in Dilworth. I've always thought if only there was a gospel preacher there. The problem, though, is Myers Park Baptist is a mainline Protestant church. I've been there, and their essential doctrine is that Jesus is a moral man. They're not a Church of Christ scientist church, but they basically teach the same thing, that he just is an example of goodness. And the truth of the matter is the Christian gospel teaches that the cross is the whole ballgame. Had the cross not happened, we of all people would be most to be pitied. We are in trouble if the cross didn't happen. The Christian science cult is just teaching us that the cross is just some man, gold star for Jesus. He showed us that what it really means to be a good guy and sacrifice for everybody. So you're thinking, okay, <coughs> so then what is salvation in their view? What does it mean to be saved in the Christian science cult? Well, basically they would say being saved is in essence stopping, ceasing to believe in the illusion, which is a little weird. They'd say, well, if sin doesn't exist, we really just need to be saved from wrong thinking. Sin is kind of like a bad dream, and we just need to learn not to believe that dream. You ever had a kid wake up all scared because they had a bad dream? Well, any mom or dad worth their salt will say, sweetie, it's okay, it didn't actually happen. That's what they think sin is. They just think you need to be coddled to say, it's okay that you cheated on your wife. It's okay that you murdered that guy. It's okay that you X, Y, or Z because it's just an illusion. It's all right, honey, just wake up. It was just a bad dream. That's essentially the view. Yeah, funny, something tells me that they wouldn't hold that view if that sin was done to them. It's funny how we're really gracious until it comes at us and are like, justice, we want justice now. It's an interesting phenomenon in the Christian science cult. Salvation is basically just kind of waking up to this uh, illusion that sin well, it really isn't real like we thought. What about eternity? What do they believe happens when you die? They have a strange doctrine of heaven and of hell. They don't think hell is literal. They just think hell is basically a wrong state of mind. You ever heard heaven is just a state of mind? They, they think hell is, well, just a state of mind. It's just a guilty conscience. It's just in your head. They would say sin makes its own hell and goodness is its own heaven. Hell is just, you know, you, it's all between your head. It's all in your head. It's just between your, eye, uh, between your ears. Whereas they would say heaven also is not literal. It's just a right state of mind. Heaven is just you thinking right about things. It's waking up to the reality that sin and all the junk you heard from your grandma that went to the First Baptist Church is just some big illusion. So folks, are you now getting with me that we're dealing with something that is wildly out there? This is not Christianity in any way, shape, or form. Do I even need to answer the final question of our study tonight? What are the differences? Last week's was admittedly more difficult. I, I hated that I wasn't here. I actually wanted to teach on Seventh-day Adventism because Seventh-day Adventism is more difficult to parse. It has far more similarity with Orthodox Christianity. Christian science does not. It denies who God is. In its essence, Christ, uh, Christian science make believe a God. It creates this God, concocts this God out of its own imagination. That's why I view it as demonic. It essentially crafts a God, casts a God in its own image. It's rooted in this helplessness. I want what I want, and I'm going to make a God reflect what I want. I want to be healed. That God will heal me. It's interesting that Christian science is far less pronounced today. That's probably because modern medicine has made such great advances. Although I will say, do you want to know what's fascinating? I opened up YouTube. I typed in Christian science. And guess what one of the first search results was? Christian science chaplain of Harvard University. And I thought, well, that's odd. I mean, Harvard, which fancies itself as one of the greatest institutions of higher education in all the English-speaking world, Harvard University, which, you know, by and large, kind of has a terrible view of the supernatural. Harvard University, don't they have like some medical school of some kind? Harvard University, how could they possibly have a chaplain of Christian science? What is this lady? So I play the video. It's four or five minutes long. And she is very happy. 
very proud, very confident, and evidently very welcomed on that campus community. At least the video makes it out to be this way. And I'm thinking, oh, the deception. Can you imagine if I was the evangelical chaplain on Harvard University? I'd be egged and kicked out of town. And this lady who's teaching stuff that any one of those professors would laugh at behind her back, she's somehow, some way, kind of respected in this community. It's a mockery. It's a demonic mockery of who God is. It denies who he really is. It denies what God has said. It superimposes on God's holy revealed word this extra biblical, new, fresh revelation, so to speak, from this lady in the 1800s named Mary Baker Eddy, superimposed on the Bible as the decoder key to help you figure out what the Bible means. By the way, one of the key distinctives of Protestantism is we believe in the Scripture as the sole authority. Do you know what I know what people thought before the Protestant Reformation? Do you know who they thought was really the authority? The preacher. They would call him the priest and ultimately the Pope. You needed me to tell you what the Bible meant. I was your decoder key. And without me, you were without hope. But do you wanna know what happened in the Protestant Reformation? We said, no, no, guess what? None of you. Me included, I don't need a priest. I don't need somebody to stand between me and God. I have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who intercedes between me and the Father. I am able to read the Bible and by the grace of God, understand it with the basic educational means available to me. I don't require somebody to decode it for me. Now, that's not to suggest you shouldn't sit under good teaching. God has called pastors to shepherd you, to help you understand the Bible, but you don't have to go to a pastor for your only hope of knowing. That's why, by the way, most non-Protestants, just candidly a lot of Roman Catholics, don't read their Bible. And often it's because the basic overarching message of the Roman Catholic Church is, well, just go to your priest. Whatever the Pope says settles it, and he'll just disseminate it to you, so just drink from that fountain. You don't need to self-feed, just come get fed. That is a key distinction between Catholicism and Protestantism. The teaching of the Christian science cult is like Roman Catholicism of old. We need Mary Baker Eddy in that book to help us understand the Bible. Denies who God is, denies what God said, it denies who we are. Do I even need to belabor this point? It teaches us that we are sinless and these divine beings. And that is clearly contrary to the way God has revealed who we are in the scripture. And finally, it denies what we really need. It says that all we need to do is to unlock this secret to immortality. The fountain of life can be found. Jesus found it. You can find it too. If you could only learn how to believe the right thing. And we know that the scripture teaches that our greatest need is that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so folks, let's put a punctuation mark on our study tonight. Christian science is neither Christian nor science. It is, in a word or two, nothing but a bunch of grape nuts. Why don't you join me as we pray and let's ask God to grant us the grace if we were to interact with any folks, which by the way, I never have to my knowledge. If we were to interact with any folks within this cult, may God grant us the grace to speak to them the hope that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I am asking by the power of your spirit that you would equip us to be faithful witnesses to the hope we have. If indeed, Lord, we believe this to be true, then this is the greatest, most urgent news this world can ever hear, exceeding any message that could come from the Oval Office. There is this great life-changing news of the gospel that we know, and so would you put it on our mouths. May it burn within our hearts, and may we be found faithful to witness to it. Lord, for those in the bondage of cultic practices like Christian science and Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventism and, and Mormonism and the like, we pray, Lord, that you would open blind eyes to see the truth. We pray that you would stay the hand and ministry of Satan, which is nothing but a deceiver who is lying. And Lord, I pray that my teaching tonight was faithful and fair. If there was anything I said that was uncharitable or created, perpetuated a caricature. I pray that it would be quickly forgotten and that which was faithful and true, Lord, I pray that you would seal to the hearts of we, your people, so that we will be more faithful witnesses 
sharper instruments in your redemptive hands. And so I thank you, Lord, for these dear brothers and sisters who come here week in, week out to study your word and those things related to your word. And I pray it was a useful study for them and for the glory of your name. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.